Cree artist Thompson Highway is perhaps one of the most interesting people one is ever likely to hear of. He was literally born in a snowbank in northern Manitoba, studied classical piano in Europe, became one of Canada's most decorated playwrights, and helped kickstart the now thriving field of Indigenous literature in Canada. He is a former social worker, an LGBTQ icon, an artistic director emeritus of Native Earth Theatre, a best-selling novelist, and last year won further awards for nonfiction with his memoir, Permanent Astonishment. Mr. Highway has received the Order of Canada, 10 honorary degrees, has had his works performed and programmed in countries around the world, and as soon as this early morning interview is over, we'll be getting back to writing for an impending deadline. Thompson Highway, thank you so much for carving out some time to be here this morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, I, I want to build this conversation towards what it might mean to have an affirmative inclusion, in, inclusive vision of, of art and culture in the present era. Uh, but let's begin, I think a good place to build towards that is right at the beginning. Can you speak a little bit to the conditions around your birth and the society you were born into and the family you were born into? Well, as it turns out, uh, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Southern Ontario. Where, where precisely? Niagara. Are you kidding? Well, just around St. Catharines there. That's right. Uh, where Brock University is there. I've lectured at Brock. Uh, and at the Shaw Festival. But anyway, um, I discovered, I, I realized very slowly that, uh, very gradually, that 95% of Canadians live on a very narrow strip of land along the American border. Yeah. And that's 95%. And that's a lot. And uh, a journalist once described that area as being, uh, Canada as being kind of a horizontal chili. You know, Chile is a very long country, 3,000 kilometers long by 200 kilometers wide. And uh, so uh, very, very few, very, very few Canadians have ventured further north of that. And that is because it's too expensive for one thing. It's very hard to get up there. And uh, people just haven't had an opportunity yet because the country, the country is not known. Uh, it's just an extraordinary land. Uh, uh, you know, did you know that Nunavut alone, and I was, I was born just under Nunavut, just uh, the Manitoba Nunavut border. Nunavut alone is, is, one, is the same size of all of Western Europe. <laughs> That's Europe from the Soviet Union right up to Portugal and everything in between. That's how large that land is. And uh, Nunavut, yet Western Europe, where I've spent a lot of time, has a population of almost half a billion now. And yet Nunavut has only 30, 37,000 wow. people. When you go up there, you see a landscape that is empty of people, thank goodness, which is part of what makes it so beautiful. Uh, and, it's, uh, and we have the most, we are the most water rich country in the world. Mm. You know, Australia is a, it has no lakes. Spain has no lakes. Saudi Arabia has no lakes and so on and so forth. Canada, on the other hand, has over 1 million lakes, fresh water lakes with fresh, most of them with fresh, drinkable water and uh northern manitoba where i come from north north of uh thompson manitoba that's the nearest town unfortunately uh it's uh it's uh, way up north where i was born uh close to right next under Nunavut and the saskatchewan border not churchill that's what people think a lot it's not Churchill. that's the eastern side i'm on the west the extreme northwest corner of manitoba mm -hmm. and uh, that area alone has 10,000 uh, 10, lakes, wow. 10,000 lakes. And when you see them, it's unbelievable. You have to fly over them to, to get a perspective. And usually it's by bush plane. And in the old days, when I was a kid, that was the only way of flying was by bush plane. Hmm. And so what people don't understand about a landscape like that is for the average kid to go to school. It's, it's just a matter of walking down the street about three blocks. Right. And you go to grass, what do you call it, public school. To go to high school, you, to, you walk about an hour, 45 minutes to the nearest high school, it's 45 minutes away. Uh, to go to the university, university, you take a bus and you're at 40, and an hour later, uh, you, uh, you've gone across that and you're at, the, at your nearest university, okay? Northerners don't have that. We don't have schools. We, don't have, we didn't have stores. We didn't have any of those services. So in order for anybody to get an education, Education, if they wanted to get an education, they had to leave home. They had to be sent away. And so our school was uh, 300 kilometers from 300 miles from where, we, where I was born, maybe even 400. Uh, 
We had no choice to go to the school. Otherwise, and my, what age were you going there? Me? What age what? were you going there? So I was almost seven. seven. Uh, otherwise, my father didn't have any had no, had no school whatsoever. He had he was the eleventh, uh, the, the first of seven sons. He never went to school for one day. So he didn't. And so we were the eleventh and twelfth children. And also the other thing about understand about Northern culture is that you you probably come from a family of two kids, right? Yep, three. Yeah. Uh, or two or three, that's all. And many, many kids, there's only one kid. Uh, well, up there, they have 14 kids, 16 kids. My uncle Adam had 22 children, okay? And so we live a different lifestyle and their demands are different. And so uh, uh, we went to school because part of, part of it was that we had, to, we had to be fed. If you had 14 children, what would you feed them for breakfast tomorrow morning? <laughs> Money to feed them. Yeah. Right. Where would you get money to house them in a warm place? Because we had no no heating where I come from. We had wood stoves. Uh, the nearest place was a boarding school, and the only boarding schools available up there were the native residential schools, which have had, which of course have had, uh, have acquired a bad name for themselves. And uh, there were bad, bad bad things that happened, but they didn't really affect me because I'm not a I'm a diehard optimist. I uh, I had a wonderful time. One of my great privileges was having the. I didn't speak a working English after. I, I, I didn't speak a word of English until I was seven, uh, and even I didn't become fluent in the language until I was fifteen. We spoke two native languages of where I come from, because the, the Cree, which is my mother tongue, and the Dene, which is the the the, the nation that's that's next to us, mm. further north of us. So a lot of us grew up in, in bilingually in Cree and Dene. And uh, so I didn't start learning English until I was 11, uh, seven, and then become fluent in language until I was about 17. And so it was a very hard to haul, but I appreciated it because it was such hard work and I, you had to make such an effort. And my father was so magnificent as a father that he wanted me to go to school to get the education that he didn't have. And he re did it and regretted that because his other brothers, his younger brothers, already had already gone to school a bit like grade seven, grade six, that kind of stuff. But that was about the level of education up there back then. And so he didn't have any, and he wanted dearly for his second youngest, his two youngest sons to get that education. So there were 12 of us and on the 11th. And so we were put on a plane by him very kindly and very lovingly. We weren't taken away. We weren't ripped from the, uh, the, you know, the arms of our parents. We were put on a plane very lovingly and, and I was told to go out there and get education a spectacular education of the kind that he had never had. So I had an extraordinary father who was a magnificent man. We worshipped him. He was the king of the north. And uh, I wanted to really do a good job for him. And I went to school and I worked doubly hard. I worked twice as hard as all the other students. Something I had done since age three. You know, my job as a three-year-old was to go down the hill with a pail and then go up the hill with a pail full of water in the wintertime in freezing temperatures with a, a pail full of water with ice in it. There was a hole in the ice down the lake. And so that my sister, who was taking care of us at this one point, could do the laundry, you know? And so today, to do the laundry, you have to just put your, your clothes into a machine and, and you press a button and the machine does your laundry for you. For us, our sister and our mother, our oldest, older sister and our mother had to scrub every item of clothing by hand on a washboard with water that I had to go get down the hill for, for them. So I've worked hard all my life and I, hard work is in my blood and I love it because I love my father so much. And so I had, to, so I worked twice as hard as everybody else at school because I, I did it for him. And as a result, well, the results I got were t twice as good as everybody else's. If he had not sent me to that school today, I would be a janitor or a garbage truck driver, okay? Instead, because I went to school for 18 years today, I am a concert pianist who writes books on the side. <laughs> How many people from Rosedale, can, how many boys from Rosedale can say that? Right, right, yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about how, uh, and obviously this feeds into this, this going and getting this education and working as hard as you did under those kinds of conditions where you, you had such motivation to, how that brought you into a life into the arts and how that brings you to music and writing and uh, how that side of your life started to evolve. 
And was there a point in which you realized that that was where your life was going? Or did it, was it more sort of one step at a time? It happened much later, my realization. I was just working hard. I wanted to learn my lessons really, really perfectly. I mean, my average, almost all the way through grade school was 95, okay? 93.7, all that stuff. Uh, I mean, I, I used to get 100% in mathematics, you know? And because uh, I worked so hard at it. And I love numbers, and it was one of my favorite subjects. And, uh, uh, I, and, then I, and then there was a piano at the boarding school, and I saw it and I fell in love with it instantly. I heard somebody play, I saw somebody play in the choir, the accompanist, who was this girl. And uh, so I asked, uh, so my, eventually, I, I kept looking at this piano in choir. I wasn't paying attention to the music, I was looking at the piano, and, it, and this nun, the choir director, realized I was, I was obsessed with it, this piano. So she told the piano teacher to pick me up as a student, and so I started taking lessons when I was 11, which is way too late to be a competitive concert pianist but when you're an adult. Most concert pianists, competitive concert pianists today on the international stage grew up in Be cities like Beijing, Yuja Wang, uh, Moscow, Evgeny Kissin, Sviatoslav uh, Richter, and so on and so forth, or New York, or London, or Vienna. You know, the music capitals of the world where they were closeted, surrounded by the best piano music teachers in the world. We didn't, I didn't have that opportunity. Uh, the teacher was okay. She was a bit mediocre, I, although I hesitate to see it, to say it, but she wasn't all that great. But at least I was playing the piano and I just, I was obsessed with it. Uh, around me, there were kids, other kids who were taking the piano lessons and they couldn't stand it. They hated piano lessons. And most kids today, okay, mm -hmm. uh, out there in the cities, hate piano lessons. They're forced to by their parents. Mm -hmm. And it's a process of extreme pain for them. Well, not me. You couldn't, I, I never understood that, how you could, you could hate something as beautiful as music. I can't, I still can't understand that. And so I loved it. And so I worked very hard at it, and I became very, very good, very quickly. And, uh, and then I realized when I was in, uh, when I went to high school in Winnipeg, I kept studying over there. And then university, at the University of Manitoba, I kept studying over there. Then I went to Europe as well, in the middle of all this. And I kept studying, and I had the most extraordinary teachers. My te the teacher who really taught me to become a pianist had the same teacher as Glenn Gould. Wow. Who I could be the best, the greatest piano, concert pianist who has ever walked, who has ever come out of Canada. Nice. So that's the kind of musical education I have. Top notch, top notch. And uh, I could have had a career, I, I would have had a small career. I, I would, like I said, I hadn't started soon enough. And so uh, I would have had a national career. I could, I certainly would have been a chamber player. I had a chamber group. I, we, when you take a music degree, you have to learn all the disciplines, uh, accompanying opera singers, accompanying German leader, singers of the German leader, uh, chamber music, like music with a violin, music with a, a cello and a, a violin and the piano. That's, I had that. I, I, I had a beautiful, beautiful trio. And you accompanied choirs, you accompanied operas, all the stuff. And you fell in love with this music. The, the operatic uh, compositions of the Italian, the great Italian melody makers, like Verdi and Puccini and Bellini and, uh, and on and on and on. They were absolutely magnificent and they inspired me. And I wanted to, something in me said I wanted to write like that. And uh, to make a long story short, now I do. I've lived with me. I've gone to a lot of opera. I've seen a lot of, most kids in Canada have never seen an opera. Mm -hmm. I've seen in okay. Paris, in New York, in Vienna, in Budapest, in La Varsovie, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, I've seen uh, London, England. Oh my goodness, we used to get 50 pence tickets when I was this in the early 70s. 50 pence tickets for what they called the guards, way up on the sixth balcony for students. And I, I saw, like, oh, oh, guys, that year, I was there for about a year, I saw about at least 12 operas sung by the greatest artists in the art form. I saw Joan Sutherland. And what is probably, I think, it was her last performance of Lucia de Lammermoor by, uh, by uh, Giacomo Puccini. Uh, and most, most, most people don't even know who Giacomo Puccini was or what Lucia de Lammermoor is. And, you know, so it's, I got all this extraordinary education. And what really struck me about that opera and many operas was that here was, here's a story that takes place in Scotland, Lammermoor. It's a moor in Scotland. And Lucia, of course, is a woman called uh, Lucia, Lucia in, in Italian. And here's and it's an, it's an Italian village. And here we are watching 
And then they have huge casts in European operas. 30, 40 singers running around, Italian singers, running around on stage wearing kilts and singing in Italian, right. you know? And ever since then, I believe that the whole, uh, everything goes, everything goes, you know, you, an Italian, if an Italian can sing in Italian and, and, and I pretend to be singing in Scottish, then, can, then, then a white man like yourself can be singing in Cree. You can learn the language. It's a privilege to learn another language. All that stuff so affected me. And of course, I saw a lot of Broadway musicals. I spent a lot of time in New York over the years. I see a lot of Broadway musicals. I saw the original hair when I was 18 years old. I, the original hair, this is like 1968, something like that. Yeah, I saw the original hair. I saw I saw Linda Ronstadt in Pir the Pirates of Penzance, stuff like that. <laughs> I, have, I have a musical education from there. Yeah. And so that's that, that served me that's good stand. I love it. I will try yeah. and bring this home as, as quickly as I can. So I'm going to kind of um, maybe give you I, and uh, uh, I know we're having some technical difficulties and you're on you're on you're on a short time right now. So I'm going to mm -hmm. kind of throw a little bit at you and mm -hmm. see if you can answer this as a sort of final culminating question as much as 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 suits you well. Um, mm -hmm. You've already touched on uh, how you've gone through these different traditions and how you said you so, sort of everything is fair game. Can you speak a little bit to um, how you get to making work that combines your artistic experience in different traditions, but really brings Cree voices, um, uh, the history of uh, uh, your upbringing and, and of uh, indigenous perspectives in Canada uh, mm -hmm. to the forefront and where you think, if, if we were to look at what it means today to have an inclusive vision of art and culture, because of course the, it is a difficult tightrope for a lot of people to walk between respecting those traditions that you have so much reverence for, but also not having other traditions get squashed out in the process that have been historically perhaps pushed under or, or even you know, um, uh, very sometimes deliberately pushed under. Um, where do you sit within all of that? If that's not too much to ask you as a culminating question. I think that whatever you do, whoever you are, always your number one objective should always be excellence. Just be the best you can, you can be. And I've read a tremendous, I have very, very good education. I worked very hard for it. I've said English literature like you would not believe. And uh, for instance, and French literature and even Russian literature, you know, like the Dostoevsky and the Tolstoy and all the rest of it. Um, I read all that stuff and I continue to read it. I'm reading Dante right now, for instance. How many people out there have read Dante? Yeah? Uh, and uh, um, because I need the information for, for a book that I'm writing, I'm, I'm sending somebody down to hell in my character. And and he wants and I want him to enter hell and know what's what he's seeing, you know all that. And so all this writing affects my work, and all this music that I've learned also affects my work because I think in very musical terms. I think in rhythm, rhythm is a very important part of my work, you know. Uh, a language has to go. I, I read I read something. Oh, I don't have my screen with me, but uh, you know stuff like uh, I you know like maybe. Uh, Maybe a this and maybe a that. Maybe a this and maybe a that. Well, I didn't like maybe. It was too soft. I wanted something more percussive. So I wrote perhaps a this, perhaps a that, perhaps a this, you know, that kind of stuff. Those, those kind of choices, musical choices. And so that affects my work very, very much. And now today, and I'm going to blow my own on a bit here, okay? Uh, is that uh, now my work, um, I mean, this is really, really blowing my heart. I'm ashamed to do it because I'm not a horn blower. I'm, not, I'm a piano player. I don't play the horn. I play the piano. <laughs> uh, and I, the last time I blew my, I tried to blow my own piano. I, I got dry lips, and I had to move to campus casing for a good while. Fortunately, I, I left campus casing after that. Anyway, you know, somebody, a journalist when that play first came out, a journalist, oh, long time ago, a journalist from campus casing called me up and says, "So what are you writing about campus casing?" And to tell you the truth, there's nothing in the play about campus casing whatsoever. It's just a musical line that attracted my attention. Most like, uh, most like, uh, and a prime example of that is uh, uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf by Albert, Edward Albee. That play has nothing that's ever to do with it. <laughs> it's just that musicality of that line. And at one point, uh, Martha teases uh, whatever the guy's name is. What is his name? Martha's husband. Oh, I can't remember now. Anyway, uh, teases, uh, it'll come to me. Uh, 
and it says, who was afraid? Of, he was, she was uh, teasing. It's a, it's a very violent marriage, right? Terrible. And so he teaches her husband, he teaches her his wife with a, with a lad singing. Who is afraid of the big bad wolf, the big bad wolf, the big bad wolf? That's what he wanted to sing. But the owner, the, the owners of the copyright wouldn't let him. So he had to change, he had, that, he had to adjust the line. And also, you have to adjust the music. You can't use the music unless you have, you pay a lot of money for it. And so he, that's how the title of the show, the, the title, the, the show ended up being Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? <laughs> uh, my stuff is uh, now, I'm going to blow my own horn. Uh, is that Native people, Native writers, not just me, uh, have now arrived at a place in, 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 the, in the development of culture and their, their culture and arts in general, where, where our works are being compared to the likes of uh, Molière, mm. uh, Bertolt Brecht, mm. uh, even uh, there, there was somebody, there was a comparison just recently, Molière, there was somebody else, oui, question? Je veux juste dire bye-bye. Okay. Bonne journée. Uh, en tout cas, um, Molière, oh, the greatest, Chekhov. My work is being compared to Chekhov, you know? And, uh, and also, even Shakespeare. Uh, Dried up Salomon's Capsicism has been called by people who know their material a, a midwinter's mid night's dream. And when you look at the text, yeah. you'll find out where that is. Yeah. Where the texture is puck, okay, and, and weaves this web of magic that affects the entire play. So we think in those terms because we're because we're educated. I'm a literate person, and I'm very very proud of it. And I continue, and I will continue to work in that manner as long as I as long as I live and as long as I'm healthy. Aside from this, I'm usually healthy as a horse. Uh, I've you know what I've never had I haven't had a flu in like seven years, something like that. So this is this is not a flu, but it's something like that. I've never had a flu uh, in many many years. There's a reason for that, but I'll I'll tell you some other time. Anyway, that's my answer to that question. Okay. Fantastic. But I was—I just wanted to hark back to the first question you asked me. Uh, what kind of, what, how, why, how I feel the educate about the education that I got at that school, the notorious residence school that I went to, which was notorious at all. It was a beautiful place by a beautiful lake. Oh my God, Clearwater Lake is the most beautiful lake in Northern Manitoba. It's the most beautiful lake on the face of the earth. We got a turquoise water, clear, clear, emerald green, and no islands. Oh my God, it's a beautiful lake. So we saw the lake every day from the dormitories and heard the music, its music all night long. It sang us to sleep and it sang us awake. And I, I, that's all I have is positive memories. I have no time for negativity in my life. But the most uh, uh, astonishing, the most uh, astonishing experience for me there was that it gave me the privilege of, le of uh, learning your beautiful language, because I didn't speak English until before that. So that, and the reason I'm so happy about that is so that I can res listen, so I can listen respectfully to what you have to say, what you have to think, right? And I've moved on to other, other European languages as well, because I've lived in France for 14 years. Donc, je peux parler français couramment, par exemple. Uh, je peux parler, je peux parler italien autant qu'anche, pour que, au visite, au visite en italien, in, in Italia, oh, say, any, six, six years, say, any, six years. Um, I will live six, three months in Rome and three months in, uh, three months, three years in Rome and three years in, Napoli, Napoli, Naples, in the south, which is when the pandemic hit, and we had to flee with our lives. But yeah, and so we can't wait to go back. That's fantastic, and that's such a. And I, I should mention that I speak music. I speak lang the language of music uh, perfectly. Yeah. yeah, and I should I should mention you've also for for people interested in in going in the other way. Um, that you've also written librettos in Cree and you've brought Cree language to, to the biggest stages. Uh, and there are more people who are taking courses and are interested in learning Cree language and, and indigenous languages in Canada and learning yeah. that kinds of, of listening that you're talking about with the languages that we have here in Canada. Yeah, that was one of the greatest privileges in my life recently was to have it be, being commissioned with the, uh, the L'Orchestre Symphony de Montréal to write an opera. And so I did that, and it was beautiful, beautiful experience. And uh, just to be able to do that, it's like a privilege beyond compare. That was at the Maison, uh, the Place des Arts. I've had venues like the Place des Arts, Kerner Hall, 
like the, which is the Carnegie Hall of Canada. I've had extraordinary privileges, worked with extraordinary people, and I want to keep doing that until the day I die. I want to work with extraordinary people like yourself, because I'm told that you're an extraordinary man. And who knows? We may end up working together. I might put you into one of my operas. That would be one. I'll start, I'll, I'll start doing my vocal exercises right away. That would be great. Thompson Highway, that's a perfect affirming way to end this interview. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're so busy. Do you want to plug the thing that you're writing right now, or should we keep that hush-hush for the moment? I think it should be kept hushy-hush. Okay. Uh, I should, like normally, if you talk about them too far in advance, you, you jinx them. Sure. <laughs> Somebody will die, the, the, the publishing house will burn down, and that kind of stuff. I'm scared of that kind of stuff. You know, uh, you look, or you get your you yourself will die. You know that it's, that happens. You know, and uh, so I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. Fair enough. Then I'll say, uh, everybody, check out Permanent Astonishment, the book that you released last year. Fantastic yeah. memoir that's uh, won a bunch of awards and huge acclaim for good reason. So Thompson Highway, thank you so much for being here. It's been such a pleasure to get to talk to you. Thank you so much for for inviting me, and thank you so much for being you because you are doing some very, very good work with a good heart. And I really, we artists really appreciate that, those kinds of people, people like yourself, who are great supporters and great fans and great promoters of our work. Yeah. It's a great pleasure. Thompson Highway, you have a great one. Thank you so much.